This is a CompuMotor model 5751 stepping motor. It gets its name from being 57 millimeters in diameter and 51 millimeters long. It is a 23 frame size motor. A 23 frame size specifies a 2.3 inch square flange, the dimensions of its pilot, the length and diameter of the shaft, the bolt hole circle, and the bolt hole dimensions. Other specifications include this 34 frame CompuMotor 8393 and this 42 frame, which is 4.2 inches across the face. To show how a step motor is constructed, we'll take a 5751 apart. Most of the things we'll do in disassembly actually destroy the motor. First, we pry off the epoxy back cap. Just cutting the motor cable short like this is enough to destroy the motor because the cable wires are integral to the winding. Cut them this short and the motor must be rebuilt. To show how the rotor is constructed, we'll remove it from the stator. Since the rotor is magnetized in position, removal causes the motor to permanently lose two-thirds of its magnetic field. The stator has windings and teeth which give it positioning capability. This small wire is the end cap ground strap. The rotor has a cap over the front bearing which is spring loaded by a series of wave washers to allow for rotor end play. This potential for axial motion should be considered in designing systems which include these types of motors. This is a single stack 23 frame rotor. This is a two stack version with two magnetic stacks and this is a three stack. The difference in color is due to a different epoxy used by the vendor in assembly. Looking at the single stack, we have a stainless steel shaft, two bearings, and a magnetic stack. Motor life is mostly dependent upon the bearings, which are the only moving part of the motor, and the only part subject to wear from the load. So CompuMotor uses ABEC 3 quality bearings. When used within specification, steppers typically have a long life. Here you see the larger size 34 rotor with a smaller 23. By increasing the diameter of the rotor, we can increase its torque capability, but we also increase its inertia by the square of the increase in radius. Since the relationship of inertia to rotor length is linear, motors are also built in various stack lengths, as seen with these two and three stack 34s. Here we see a single stack segment removed from the rotor shaft. Its teeth are designed to line up with the stator teeth on the outer part of the motor. The black epoxy on the end shows the rotor assembly on this particular motor is bonded, not riveted. There's a slot in the middle created by a spacer. Within each stack segment is a single permanent magnet like this, which gives the motor its direction. The entire assembly is pressed on the shaft. The reason these motors are called hybrid steppers is because not only do they have the permanent magnet, which by itself is enough to make a motor from, but they also have these punched laminates which improve performance by focusing the flux from the magnet. In fact, the laminates alone could be used to make what's called a variable reluctance motor. But without a magnet, there's no directional capability. We get a hybrid stepper by combining the laminates with the magnet. It's called a stack because the laminates are literally stacked around the magnet. Solid end caps go at both ends. For a two-stack version, add a spacer and a second stack. Note the flat on this shaft. It's probably the reason why this motor failed. Improper machining on shafts is the most common cause of motor failure. Typically, the motor is placed innocently in a vise. Then a milling tool is run onto the shaft. The impact of the machining operation exceeds the side load specification of the bearing, driving the rotor across the three mil air gap into the stator. When the motor is operated afterwards, the stator teeth peel off the rotor epoxy coating. Performance quickly degrades and the motor must be replaced. Shaft modifications should be done only by a machinist experienced with motors, using proper procedures like supporting both ends of the shaft with V-blocks so the blocks take the load, not the motor. It should be allowed to rotate freely so the bearings don't absorb the force of the machining. Take care to prevent magnetic particles generated by machining from entering the bearing attracted by the magnet inside. This too can result in motor failure. 
Since machining can cause such problems, what's the best way to couple load to motor? Flexibly. As with one of these helical couplers that attach simply by tightening two set screws and flex to accommodate misalignment between the motor and the load, lengthening bearing and therefore motor life. Coupling directly to the motor with timing belts or chains can also shorten motor life by exceeding the bearing side load specification. If the chain or belt is tightened too much or if a heavy load is accelerated too rapidly, avoid these problems by providing the load with its own bearing structure.